Hello, this is Richard Herb with KKMI. We're here in a beautiful 51-foot Beneteau from Passage Yacht uh, with a Yanmar 4J H11. And we're going to do an engine oil change and fuel filter service. When you're going to do the service, the first thing you need to determine is the correct engine model and serial number so that you're able to get the correct parts and those numbers are typically on a plate on the engine many times on the top of the engine on the valve cover and they're also on the filters themselves um, assuming it has the correct filters on it you can use those numbers as well and with the model and serial number your local dealer will be able to supply you with the correct filters that screw on to the engine both for oil and fuel however the primary fuel filter in many cases by a second vendor or different manufacturer so you really need to get that information from the primary fuel filter which typically is located somewhere near the engine between the engine and the fuel tank and it could be made by different manufacturers and have a different uh, many different numbers so collect that information first so that you're able to get the correct parts yeah, you're going to want to refer to your engine owner's manual for your maintenance schedule. There is a listing in there that has uh, typically a chart and tells all the, all the items to be done and a time frame as well as, in many cases, an hour number that you want to keep track of. So refer to your owner's manual for the maintenance required for your engine and transmission. Things you'll need to complete this service. The tools required will include oil, obviously, an oil filter, and fuel filters. If you have a 1995 or older engine, you will likely need zinc ZDDP replacement that the new oil doesn't have. We'll talk more about that later. You'll need an oil pump, either a vacuum type or a drill-driven type, to draw the oil out of the engine. You'll need a bucket and a couple of plastic mixing cups to collect oil that leaks out of the filter. You need a clean funnel. You'll need absorbent pads and towels. You need a sheet or drop cloth. You'll need some diesel fuel that's clean, very important. It's got to be clean fuel. And then you'll need a knee pad so you don't wreck your knees. You'll need to start the engine to warm it up so the oil will be easily pumped out. But first, you need to check the fluid levels in the engine. Check the oil, check the coolant level before starting the engine. Make sure that the C valve is open, the water intake, so that you will not damage the water pump before starting the engine. Start the engine and check for water flow out the side of the boat. Run the engine at a fast idle to warm it up. So if you'd like to take an oil sample from the engine to get it analyzed, now is the time to do it after the engine warms up. The kit will supply you with a syringe type uh, unit with a hose or there's other possibilities depending on the one that you use. But one way or another, you take the hose, you insert it into the oil dipstick area and you draw out oil into the syringe or the pump, whatever it is you have. You label it and then you send it off to a lab and have it analyzed. This is useful in determining potential problem areas with the engine, but it's really only useful over a long period of time with several oil changes. So if you want to do it and gain most benefit, you need to do it repeatedly whenever you change the engine oil. Determine on the engine where the draw out point for the oil is. Typically it is the dipstick if the dipstick tube extends all the way to the bottom of the oil pan. Some engines have a separate hose attached to the oil pan permanently that you use to draw the oil out of the engine. Next, use the adapters included with the oil pump out to make connection to the oil draw out tube or to the dipstick. Make sure that there are no air leaks, otherwise the oil will not be drawn out. 
if you're using a vacuum type oil extractor, pump the oil handle several times. The oil will be drawn out of the engine. Be careful to not overfill the oil vacuum pump assembly. If it gets over full, it will draw oil into the vent part of the oil pump and it will leak out onto the floor. So make sure that you don't overfill it. When three-fourths full is about as much as you'll want to put in there. When all the oil is drawn out of the engine, it will make a gurgling sound. After it does that, give it a minute or two and then pump the handle once or twice again to get all the oil out of the engine. Then when you disassemble the hose that goes to the pump, make sure that you block the hose with towels or whatever. Make sure otherwise it will spill. It's very easy to spill oil. And I would recommend gathering the entire hose, pump, and everything and taking it out of the boat so you minimize the spill. To remove the oil filter, select the correct wrench based on size and location so that you can get the filter off. You can also use a channel lock if that's the only thing that will fit. Unwrap the new filter and fill it with oil to minimize engine wear at startup. Make sure that you end up with a film of oil around the seal on the top of the filter. Use either absorbent rags or a catch pan of some kind to catch the oil that leaks out of the filter as you remove it. Once again, make sure the oil that you use is appropriate for the engine. Follow the manufacturer's recommendation. Screw it on and tighten it hand tight. In some cases, maybe a quarter or an eighth of a turn further, but don't overdo it. Also, when you put the filter on, if you notice that the, it seems loose within the threads, you may have an incorrect filter. Make sure the filter fits the threads properly. Yeah, so also uh, something to consider when you're going to fill the engine with oil. If your engine is made 1995 or older, it may have a requirement for zinc in the oil, which is something that was removed by government mandate in the uh, mid-2000s. So if you have an older engine, you want to add a product uh, which is available. It's called ZDDP. It's made by several different companies. It's not a cure-all or anything like that, like STP or something like that. It's a specific component that was removed from oil that the older engines require because they have a flat tappet camshaft. So if you have an older engine, add this uh, compound. Otherwise, just fill the engine with new oil. We're now ready to fill the engine with oil. Make sure that you have a very, very clean funnel. Insert the funnel in the oil fill on the engine. Open the container that the oil came in. Make sure that if it has a foil cover on the cap that you carefully remove all that. You don't want any of that to fall or get into the engine. Then fill the engine with three-fourths of the capacity of the engine approximately, not necessarily completely full. After you've filled the engine with oil, Check the level on the dipstick and verify that it's close to the full line. After you filled the engine with oil, you verified the oil level, made sure the oil caps are tight, make sure the oil filter is tight, then you start the engine. If you have an oil gauge, or in this case an oil light, you want to make sure that that, uh, and maybe a warning buzzer, you want to make sure that goes off after the engine starts so that you do have oil pressure. So at this point you should go and verify that there's no oil leak on the engine at the oil filter. 
after it runs just a minute or so, you can shut it off. Verify the oil level. As you can see, it needs just a touch to top it off. The oil filter is dry. There's no leaks. Make sure that your funnel is clean. Everything that you're using, every, everything that your all your utensils, all your hoses, make sure anything, you know, any and everything you're working with is clean. Your tools, you don't want to get any oil uh, in the oil. You don't want to get any dirt or water, or moisture, dust, anything. Try to make sure everything is very clean. Otherwise, you defeat the purpose of changing the oil in large part. Okay, now as you can see, the engine oil is full. Everything is looking good there. Very important point. When you go to check the oil, it's very important that you check the oil with the dipstick. Uh, be sure to wipe it a second time. So don't just draw it out. Don't just draw the dipstick out and check the oil. Draw the dipstick out. Wipe it off. Reinsert it. Make sure it's bottom. Make sure you've got it all the way in. Pull it out and check the oil. It's very important to note when the engine runs, the oil level drops because the oil is being circulated through the engine. Then when you shut the engine off, the oil level increases back in the oil pan. It comes up on the oil pan because the oil drains back. that has been pumping around the engine. So when you pull out the dipstick, if you just pull it out the first time, the dipstick has uh, on many dipsticks including this one at the top there's no there's no vent tube no vent hole so the oil in the dipstick is going to you're going to get a false low oil reading when you pull the dipstick out because there's pressure in this dipstick tube from the engine having drawn the oil down the oil doesn't return to the same point so always draw out the dipstick wipe it off reinsert it fully and then you'll have an accurate reading if you want to change or check the transmission fluid, that varies greatly transmission to transmission. The engines and uh, the engines and transmissions in most cases are made by separate manufacturers. So you need to, once again, verify the transmission that you have and make sure that you have the correct fluid and the correct quantity. But if you want to check it on this transmission, just use a wrench. This particular one is threaded in. Some are just a stick you pull out like the engine. Reinstall. And check the level. It's very hard to see. In this case, it's automatic transmission fluid. So some engines use, particularly bigger engines, use uh, engine oil and or automatic transmission fluid, or they, in some cases, use 90 weight oil. So in this particular transmission, you simply remove the dipstick as we had it, use an oil pump similar to the one we used on the engine, and you can pump the oil out and then fill it with ATF and make sure that you don't overfill it. Some transmissions though, once again, have, you know, there's a lot of differences between the fluid. Also, some of the transmissions are hydraulic. This particular one is a mechanical shift, but the hydraulic transmissions many times have a oil filter, which you also need to change. So to change the fuel filter on certain Yanmar engines, this is a cover that goes on, and this is a bolt that retains it and clamps on around the outside to hold it. This, I believe, is a, more of a fire cover than anything, in case you had a fire in the bilge. But at this point, you can see, this is the cartridge. This is a primary fuel cartridge. This is the water sensor. It tells you if you have water. It'll, uh, you know, make the uh, warning system go. And then these wires here, you can disconnect. This is separate 
from the filter. When you get a new filter, this is separate. It threads in, and uh, this is also used to drain off water. You can see this fitting on the bottom. Now we're ready to change the primary fuel filter. This is the first filter between uh, as the fuel comes out of the tank. It goes through this one. These wires need to be disconnected for the water sensor inside on this particular engine. Then once again, you use the pliers required, whatever one fits. Can I get one of those absorbents? Mm -hmm. Unscrew the entire assembly. Also good to shut off your fuel valves if you have them, depending on where they're located. Obviously that varies boat to boat. Next you uh, drain the fuel out of the filter and then you unscrew the water sensor. Then check the sensor, make sure it works freely and certainly inspect the O-ring. In most cases you would replace the O-ring. Then make sure your O-ring is lubricated with diesel fuel. Once again, make sure it's clean. And screw it into the new cartridge. Hand tight and certainly not much more as it is plastic. Make sure to untangle your wires. Make sure that your drain off valve is secure on the bottom for draining water. Then we're going to fill the filter. Make sure that the fuel you're using to fill the filter is absolutely clean. Otherwise, once again, you're defeating the purpose. Make sure it's absolutely full. After the filter is full, make sure, just as with the oil filter, you make sure that you've got fuel on the gasket on the ceiling surface. Just like the oil filter, make sure the old gasket isn't stuck, or there isn't an old gasket already stuck on there, and screw it on. Hand tight is sufficient. Don't over tighten it, and certainly don't leave it loose. Then, you can reconnect your wires. These wires are very fine, so be careful to not pull. If you pull them hard, they'll break easily. Make sure everything is tight. Wipe off any excess. Then we're ready to install the cover. This cover, it's hard to see, the cover has a slot that the wires feed through. So and at the bottom there's rubber. So you gotta be careful that you don't damage the wires or get them caught or pinched. Feed the wires down the slot as you push the cover over the filter. Situate it so the hooks right here, there's two hooks, are hooked over the edge of the housing. Then reinstall the bolt. Make sure that the wires here are free. 
that they're not caught right here where they go in the side and the slot and then retighten your bolt right here on the top of this uh, fuel filter the primary fuel filter and some others there is a pump this one obviously has a pump and that's used to prime the engine that can be used to push fuel draw fuel from the tank into that filter after you have turned on the fuel valve at the fuel tank obviously and then it is um, when you push that it draws from the tank and pushes fuel into the fuel pump the lift pump which is located on the engine various engines have them in different locations and that is what pushes the fuel finally through the filter and into the injection pump the secondary fuel filter on this engine is mounted right here on the starboard forward part of the engine on this filter we're going to use a standard filter wrench different engines use different kinds of wrenches as i mentioned before you can use a pliers or whatever is required to get the old one off and once again, on these filters, typically, when you reinstall them, be careful not to over tighten. Normally, hand tight or just slightly more is sufficient. Always be careful to catch the fuel. Don't allow fuel in the bilge. Dirty bilge is a safety issue as well as an environmental hazard. Note the location, this filter, even though it's a slightly different design, is the correct filter. They're both Yanmar filters. We're going to fill it with fuel. Make sure the filter is completely full. You've got diesel fuel all around the seal. Make sure there's not an old gasket left behind from previous installation or removal. I always recommend writing the date and the number of hours on the engine on your filters so that you can keep track and if somebody else ends up doing the work, it'll be obvious when the work was last completed. Now we're ready to bleed the engine and of course that varies once again engine to engine. This particular one um, doesn't require much but certainly we will work the fuel pump back on the aft filter there on the primary filter and um, then the engine should start easily and after bleeding and certainly after running double check and make sure that there are no fuel leaks as i said this is the uh, pump on the primary fuel filter that's used to fill the fuel system with fuel if the filters are all full you pretty much shouldn't require much in the way of pumping of this but on certain engines the filter is a multi-piece so you can't fill it in which case you have to use this pump or another pump the pump on the engine one way or another pump fuel into the uh, primary fuel filter and the secondary fuel filter from the primary to the secondary and then bleed out both filters and there's a screw on the top typically of the fuel filter and or near the fuel uh, injection pump there's any air in a diesel's fuel system the engine will not start okay. cautionary note if you're trying to start an engine gas or diesel under any conditions if it has to crank more than a few seconds be sure to shut off the water supply valve that we spoke about previously the water intake valve the C valve because otherwise if it has if any boat with an aqua lift muffler that's equipped with an aqua lift muffler, which is most sailboats. When you crank the engine, it pumps water, and the water pumps into the muffler, and then the muffler can fill up if the engine's not running and there isn't sufficient pressure, exhaust gas pressure, that's used to lift that water up and out the exhaust. So if you crank the engine excessively with the water valve open and the engine does not start, then you can fill the muffler and then ultimately water goes up the exhaust hose into the uh, engine through the elbow and then it can damage or destroy the engine after you have bled the engine 
and certainly make sure once again that the water is turned on when you're going to crank the engine uh, and you're ready to start it then start the engine and run it and let it run for at least five minutes or so and if you can increase the throttle setting with it in without engaging the propeller to make sure that there isn't any headed uh, you know any air bubbles that are in a bad spot that will be trapped in the fuel system that may make the engine stall after it's run a short time mainly that you're trying to get out or back into the slip after you've run the engine briefly certainly you want to come and check and make sure there are no leaks at either the primary fuel filter in this case at the aft end of the engine or the secondary fuel filter on the engine Check and make sure it's absolutely dry. Recheck the tightness. Make sure none of the clamps or hoses are leaking. Certainly these new Yanmar engines are very, very quiet and smooth. Every two years or so, sometimes even within hours or minutes of installing a new impeller, they can be damaged. Typically, though, they'll last two oil changes. Uh, once again, depending on your manufacturer, um, the water pump on this engine is located right here. And also when you run the engine, um, once again, we did check for water flow. But on the side of this pump, as on many, there's little slots, little slots in the brass. And make sure that there's no leaks because the seal on the back side of this pump can leak. And if it does, it leaks salt water down, and obviously it can damage the um, engine mounts or other parts of the engine. And it can also um, add water to your build, salt water to your build. And in some cases, it can be slung around by the belts and cause a lot of damage. So anytime you check your engine with it running, always check and make sure the bottom side of this pump, um, the brass, the little slots in the pump housing, do not have any evidence of water leakage. This is a new impeller. Certainly I would suggest using your manufacturer's genuine parts. We have a lot of parts available now. They're very low quality. You can buy online. So they can deteriorate. And once again, even though they look like they're fine, they're not. And in various, certainly in filters and pumps, certainly your water pump, it's just not worth compromising and using low quality parts. Even though they may look like what you have removed that you're replacing. This is a Yanmar water pump, a new one. Okay. When you install it, you want to lubricate it with glycerin, which is what this is, or you can use soap. You never want it like liquid kitchen soap, dish soap. You never want to use any kind of grease on the impeller. So when you install it, you put either glycerin or um, dish soap on the impeller and install it and then also on the front cover right here make sure that the seal or the o-ring or the gasket is in good condition make sure that it's not leaking approximately every two years also once again varying with the manufacturer some use longer life coolant but something that gets uh, overlooked on boat repair a lot of times is cooling it's got antifreeze just like in a car and this is the reservoir and obviously this is the coolant cap right here this you shouldn't normally have to remove never remove it when it's hot but if you're wondering if there's a leak in this system meaning that this will not draw out of here and push into here as it should this should raise up when the engine's warm and should be drawn down when the engine cools take this cap off and inspect it and the cap can be bad, and of course, in that case, you need a new cap. And you want to, every two years or so, three years, depending on the manufacturer, you want to use the correct type of coolant, flush out, and change the coolant. And don't forget, on a lot of boats like this one, we have a hot water heater, or you have a um, cabin heater tied into the engine, similar to what you have on a car, the heater hoses. These hoses, um, are easy to identify. You run the engine and these get warm. And they're typically three quarter, five eight size hoses. And so you can take these off and flush them out independently with a hose or whatever.
to make sure that you get all that old nasty antifreeze out and change the antifreeze once again every two to four years. Also as a part of an engine oil change you want to service the air inlet. Usually there's a filter in this case it's just a screen. Depending on the engine you want to make sure that that is cleaned out Otherwise, that can restrict air coming in the engine, cause it to smoke, and make it not run efficiently. The through hole is down there. This is the one that shuts off the seawater to the engine. You want to make sure that's open. Unless you're cranking for long periods, and you need to shut it off so you don't burn up or get water in the engine. And if you run the engine with that shut, then the impeller will be damaged or destroyed. So you got to pay attention to that water valve. The water valve then feeds this hose, comes up here to a C strainer. This is a C strainer, has a screen. You can just unscrew the lid, pull out the screen, clean it out, and reinstall it. This is the exhaust elbow, the mixing elbow. After the engine um, exhaust is expelled out through this, uh, this elbow is cooled with salt water. Everything else on this engine is fresh water, antifreeze, but this all the water that goes through the water pump and through the heat exchanger goes through this. And this is typically cast iron. Sometimes they're stainless. Whatever the case, these can corrode and be damaged. And this is one of the major causes of engine damage. These need to be replaced every so often, inspected for leaks. And after, you know, several years in general, they should generally be replaced. Because once again, it's the, it's the cost of not replacing them is tremendous. It can destroy the engine and get salt water in it. Some engines also have on their heat exchanger or on their transmission cooler, which this boat doesn't have, uh, some boats have zincs. So you need to look at your manual, verify any and all zincs on the engine, and most of those should be checked every three to six months and replaced as required as a part of your ongoing maintenance. So that's generally what's required to do an engine oil change and a very basic engine service. I certainly hope that's been helpful, and if we can help you at all, please let us know at KKMI. Thank you.